Hey Meg Geekers, Caitlin here. And for this week's episode, I wanted to talk about pneumonia. Over these past few chilly months, I've encountered a lot of pneumonia cases, so I thought it'd be a good idea to review. Also, it reminded me of all the high yield content pneumonia has when it comes to your boards. So let's get started. The first thing I want to talk about are the signs and symptoms of pneumonia. And I like to think of the triad of a cough, fever, and chest x-ray infiltrates. Um, but other signs and symptoms could include dyspnea or portic chest pain. You may hear crackles on exam, decreased or bronchial breath sounds, and also consolidation when you listen auscultating. And if it's very severe pneumonia, you can have hypoxemia. But not every patient with pneumonia presents like this. Um, actually, in my experience, it is rare for a patient to present with all three. Some patients just complain of chest tightness and others just have body aches. Um, some patients have altered mental status and they end up having pneumonia. And this is often seen in the elderly. Really what I'm getting at is to have a low suspicion for pneumonia. It could be a sneaky disease that can present in many different cases. Um, definitely have a higher suspicion in immunocompromised patients, long-term smokers, people who have lung disease, and especially the elderly. For instance, I'm definitely more apt to get a chest x-ray on an immunocompromised patient on chemotherapy that complains of a cough versus a young healthy patient that complains of a cough. And speaking of chest x-ray, this is a common tool used to diagnose pneumonia. Um, pneumonia is usually diagnosed when there is a chest x-ray infiltrate in combination of clinically compatible syndrome. So all those symptoms we just talked about. The next thing I want to talk about are pathogens that usually cause pneumonia, also very common test questions as well. But first of all, there are a couple different types of pneumonia I wanted to cover really quickly. Uh, there's community-acquired pneumonia, hospital-acquired, and aspiration pneumonia. Um, community-acquired pneumonia is usually caused by strep pneumo and, as the name suggests, is from the community. Hospital-acquired pneumonia is present 48 hours after you're admitted to the hospital or 48 hours after you, within 48 hours after you are discharged from the hospital. And then aspiration pneumonia is inhalation of the oral pharyngeal secretions. And this is usually due to weakening of those protective factors right in this area. The pathogens that can cause pneumonia include bacteria, viruses, and fungus. But first let's talk about the most commons. So the most common cause of community acquired pneumonia in adults is strep pneumo. The most common cause of community acquired pneumonia in children less than five years old is RSV, the respiratory syncytial virus. And the most common cause of viral cause of community acquired pneumonia in adults is influenza. The most common cause of hospital acquired pneumonia is gram negative rods. And the most common cause of aspiration pneumonia is anything in the oral flora, which includes mostly anaerobes, but also strep and staph. Now let's delve more deeply into the bacterial causes of pneumonia. Um, again, strep pneumo is the most common cause of community acquired pneumonia. The second most common cause is H influenza, which is often seen in individuals with lung disease. And then there's mycoplasm pneumonia, which is often called the walking pneumonia because usually you see this in young patients who have been functioning normally, AKA walking around with pneumonia that eventually present with the chief complaint of a cough for three weeks. Also with this bacteria, you may see bolus myringitis. Bolus myringitis is an inflammation of the tympanic membrane of the ear, often associated with small fluid filled blisters forming on the ear drum. Mycoplasm pneumonia is still being studied as a possible cause of bolus myringitis, but new studies have found cases of this to be false. Either way, it can still be seen in your boards until it is fully disproven. Now, the two gram-negative causes of pneumonia that I want to talk about are Pseudomonas and Klebsiella, both of which are more common in hospital-acquired pneumonia. Now, Pseudomonas is more common in immunocompromised patients, while Klebsiella is more common in chronically ill patients, 
probably because they are always in the hospital and Klebsiella is more common in alcoholics. Now, uh, staph A pneumonia is classically presenting as the person that had upper respiratory like symptoms and then now presenting with pneumonia. Usually it happens after influenza. Um, and then Legionella pneumonia is pneumonia that presents with pneumonia-like symptoms plus GI symptoms of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Uh, these patients might also have hyponatremia and elevated LFTs. Now, when it comes to the viral causes of pneumonia, remember I already mentioned that in children less than five years old, the most common cause of viral pneumonia is RSV. In adults, the most common cause of a viral pneumonia is influenza. Now, if your patient is immunocompromised in any way, usually um, chemotherapy patients, I like to tag on a respiratory viral panel um, to any patient that has any respiratory-like symptoms or just a plain fever. Uh, these patients can hide symptoms very easily, and it's usually awesome if you can really pin down what virus that might be attacking them since they're so immunocompromised. The last category of pathogens that can cause pneumonia is fungus. Um, the number one fungal infection that pops in my brain is the pneumocystis gervici or PCP, the opportunistic infection of HIV patients classically associated with HIV, but can also be seen in immunocompromised patients, usually on immunocompromising drugs. Um, usually this is more associated with HIV patients that are not taking their art therapy, their CD4 is less than 200, or their CD4 percentage is less than 14%. Now the other fungal infection I like to think of is histoplasma, which is usually associated with bird droppings. Uh, so if your patient is a zookeeper or has a pet parrot, think of this pneumonia, and it is also more common in the Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys. And that's it, guys. Thanks for listening. Tune in next Wednesday when I talk about the rest of pneumonia. See you then.